I want to know what the hell's going on. I want to know why these people are going all out to get me. This is the voice of Raoul Moat, from recordings he himself made. I can't please you, I can't please Sam, I can't please my kids, and I can't please myself. They show a journey into anger, desperation and paranoia. It's part of that hunting season on Mr Moat. It's everything to get me. Last month, that anger exploded, resulting in murder and maiming and Moat's suicide. Moat's killing rampage produced a bizarre reaction, arousing sympathy as well as condemnation. So what sort of man was Raoul Moat? And I've dropped him with just with one punch with a left. And what sort of world did he inhabit? I mean, I've been shot at three times. To be honest with you, you never know where to come from. Moat's voice recordings made over a nine-month period throw an extraordinary light onto a world where violence is common currency and raise profound issues on where the borderline lies between insanity and premeditated rage. And she had to cause a lot of trouble. Now she's in a lot of trouble herself now. By God, she's in a lot of trouble with this guy not having it. Using the Raoul Moat tapes, Cutting Edge will seek to get inside the mind of a killer. The story told by the Raoul Moat tapes begins in the summer of 2009. In June, Moat was accused of a common assault on a child. In an attempt to show that the authorities were using the assault charge to get at him, Moat decided to record, some secretly, some openly, his phone calls and conversations with social workers and police. You said, I'm telling you for a fact, you said, I will make you a deal. You said. Before he killed himself, he gave a selection of these recordings to a friend in a hope that they provide some sort of self-justification. Instead, they give a unique view into a mind that unleashed tragedy. There's no light at the end of the trunk. I'm living my life on the edge, just trying to get by to this next thing, and then there's another one. We asked two experts to listen to the recordings. Dr. Cleo Van Velsen, a consultant psychiatrist who deals with violent offenders. And Laura Richards, a psychologist and criminal profiler. From listening to the tapes, you do get an idea about the way he viewed the world, and that was namely that it was against him. But I certainly got a sense of very rigid uh, black and white thinking. There's very clear evidence from the tapes that he was a man who had a paranoid sensitivity, at the very least. People who are quite paranoid are always seeking evidence, and they're very preoccupied, as he was, with people telling lies. Moat would eventually be convicted of the common assault charge, the court finding that the medical and witness evidence was conclusive. Hello, I'll spell the first thing for you. It's R-A-O-U-L. And his surname is Moat, M-O-A-T. But in his first recorded phone conversation on July the 10th, 2009, Moat protested to police that if they'd only bother to interview his friends rather than his lying enemies, they'd see he was harmless. I mean, for instance, I've got endless ex-girlfriends, endless ex-girlfriends, yeah. but the only ones the police have ever invested in is the one or two that say I'll get, you know? Yeah. Not, not like, like the 150 that say, oh, he's a cracker bloke. In fact, Raoul Moat had a history of violence towards women. He also had a history of antagonism towards the police. Once in a social services waiting room, he pressed his claim that they were trying to use the assault charge to finally nail him. In 2005, I got 186 roadside stops. 186, you know? I mean, it's just beyond the joke. So, of course, when the police have got this one chance, this one chance to get us, they've not half used it, mind, and they've, they've hammered it, absolutely hammered it. You know? However much Moat exaggerated, he was justifiably a marked man. Over the previous 10 years, he'd been charged seven times for a variety of offences. These included conspiracy to murder, domestic assault, car theft, and possession of offensive weapons, including a samurai sword and a knuckle duster. But Moat had always managed to escape conviction. The officers who were dealing with the case would be in court or just outside court. So upon leaving the court, on every occasion, he would wind them up, you know. He would deliberately goad them. Um, 
can't use some of the language, you know, but he would, he, you know, he would make sure, ridicule them, I'll say, you know. Moat may have always got away with it, but police clearly viewed him as a dangerous man. Lots of violent people don't get convicted through the courts. That tells us nothing, actually. This is the type of person who needed to be watched, who was violent, who was volatile. The evidence tells us that. And I feel if the police were doing stop checks on him and everything else, it was warranted. Since his teens, Moat's career had been as a bouncer. He admitted that he'd sometimes been up to no good. But he claimed that since 2005, he'd been a reformed character, with a new business as a tree surgeon and a stable domestic life. His first long-term partner had been Marissa Ree, with whom he had two children, now aged 10 and 5. He then met the woman he said was the love of his life, Samantha Stobart. Moat had gained custody of the two children, and he and Sam were now bringing them up. To be honest with you, since I got custody, girls actually went straight. Didn't get involved in anything, didn't get involved in Moat. You know what I mean? I'm in more trouble now than what I was when I was a bit dodgy, you know? Just the police won't have it, you know what I mean? And they just keep dragging us into things, which, I mean, honestly, I'm not joking, I've done nothing for five years. No fights, no straighteners, no, not even just that bits and bobs. Kept myself clean as a whistle. But this new life Moat boasted of had now turned sour, and by July 2009, the two children had been taken into care. Newcastle Social Services were concerned that they were at risk of significant harm from Moat. But Moat began to invent a conspiracy. He claimed that the children were being deliberately prevented from phoning their stepmother Sam by their carer. He phoned up a social worker to complain. Now then, right, either you're telling her not to give contact, right, or she's taken it upon herself, which is emotional abuse. And I want this dealt with now, today. In fact, the children had their own mobile phones with Sam's number in them and were capable of ringing her at any time. But Moat was beginning to fabricate a new story. It's weaning off, isn't it? They've been weaned off her. You know what I think? The decision's been made and it was made a long time ago. Never to give us those kids back. But I'm not going to let it stand this time. I've, I've had enough. It wasn't just one carer whom Moat imagined as a threat. He believed there was a pattern. I put up with a lot of your, your last carer and I'm not going to put up with it a second time. I just find it highly suspicious the way two of these carers are being awkward. You know, lightning doesn't strike twice, you know? I asked her yesterday, I says, are you being paid bonuses to be awkward with me? You know, are you being paid bonuses to deliberately be as, as awkward as possible? His attitude to the carer is of real concern is very insulting about her. And I think that that's partly because he can't bear the idea that he couldn't care for his children well enough. And she can. On August the 12th, 2009, Moat phoned the two children at the carer's home. His four-year-old told him that she wanted to go, but he kept her on the line and attempted, with repeated questioning, to manipulate her into agreeing that she was being deliberately prevented from phoning Sam. If somebody told you not to speak to Sam, listen very carefully, love, it's important. Have you, has somebody been telling you not to speak to Sam? Listen, I love you the bits, right? You mean little darling, right? Whatever's happening, you can tell your dad, yeah? Have you been getting told off for talking to Sam? I love you very much, you know that, right? And we're not always going to be separated forever. And somebody's telling you not to say things or whatever, you can tell your dad at every time, right? You know? It's clear a four-year-old to hold a telephone conversation, they don't interact like an adult. And the fact that that little girl wanted to go and didn't want to continue to have a conversation was just the fact that something more exciting was going on in her proximity, and that's what she wanted to be engaged with. Not talking to Dad down the end of a telephone, that's the action of a normal, healthy four-year-old child. For Raoul Moat and the way that he views the world, that is everything about her being coached and her being told not to speak to Sam. The same day he spoke to his four-year-old, Moat rang a social worker. Newcastle Social Services knew the carer was looking after the children extremely well. Even Moat acknowledged they were being properly cared for. But the social worker now told Moat 
that the carer would no longer attend any meeting at which he was also present. This led to a frightening build-up of anger in Moat's recordings, in which the mask began to slip. Why is there reasons for not being in the same meetings? She feels intimidated. She feels intimidated. Well, I tell you what is, I want to put a complaint into the highest level. I want to know what she said. I want it on file, on record, right? And then we'll take it further. I'm taking this all the way, mate. I'm, okay. I'm taking it all the way this time because I've told you I'm not having this a second time. I've had enough of the way you're going on. I've had enough, right? She is an absolute liar. At no point have I raised my voice or intimidated her, right? She can get herself into that meeting in front of me, okay? You're taking her side and you're just setting me up, right? Now, I've told you, I'm not a stupid guy. No, I haven't I... taken any action that would suggest I've taken anyone's side. The action's been taken. She's saying she's not prepared to be in any more meetings because I've, 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 I've intimidated her. And she's a blatant liar. She is not fit to be with my children. She's a barefaced liar and she's causing trouble for the kids' father. She's not fit. She's a liar. She's a liar and she's a crook. I've had it with you. Raoul Moat never knew when to let it go. This absolute incessant and garrulous amount of talking going on that he was going to bully you into believing his version of events, that he would make you believe it. The tapes are very tough to listen to because of the relentlessness of them. Uh, they're, they're monologues, they're not dialogues. He's not really interested in what other people have to say, as if he's trying to batter psychologically the person that he's talking to into agreeing with him. I want to know what the hell's going on. I want to know why these people are going all out to get me. Well, what is the problem with me? You know, I want to know what's going on. Because this person has lied, she's lied, she had to cause a lot of trouble. Now she's in a lot of trouble herself now. By God, she's in a lot of trouble with this guy not having it. Not a million years. Moat was heading ever deeper into distortion and fantasy. He was on the path to a murderous rage. By the late summer of 2009, Raoul Moat's world was beginning to disintegrate. He'd been charged with assaulting a child and believed the authorities were conspiring to get him at all costs. At a meeting with social services on the 7th of September, he seemed almost resigned and looking for a way forward. I'm going to lose 100%, no matter what I present. I would like to have a um, psychiatrist, psychologist, have a word with me regularly to see if there's somewhere underlying, like where, uh, you know, a problem that I haven't seen. At a following meeting, it emerged that Moat had previously been analysed by psychiatrists. One had unearthed problems which went back to his childhood. What he was taught about was acceptance. The biggest flaw you've got with yourself is the need for acceptance. He says, when somebody mocks you or accuses you of something you haven't done, he says, you overreact. So were there problems in Moat's distant past that were now contributing to his state of mind? What sort of childhood had he had? Moat had his own childhood story that he was half English and half French and had spent the first few years of his life in France. He even used this as a reason for why his language could come across as intimidating. This is a problem, you've got to remember that English is a second language to me. I couldn't speak a word of English when I went to school over here, you know, and what I'm trying to say in English isn't always a good translation, you know, and to be honest with you, I now kind of think in English a lot more than I do in French, only until I go to France. You should tell you the people who he's meeting, he's half French and half British. He'd said uh, for the first two or three years of his life, he'd lived with his, his dad in France, a uh, nice house, loads of land, because he always used to go on about land, how he wanted to like the country lifestyle. I'm a great believer that certain things are in the blood, you know. French people think a certain way, English people think a certain way. I mean, it turns out he's never, you know, he'd never even set foot in France. He's, he's never been to France. He's just playing on the, the, the French name. The French background was Moat's make-believe. The reality was that he grew up in Newcastle in the company of his elder brother, Angus. He saw no sign of the obsessive and controlling adult Raoul would become. Raoul liked to laugh. He didn't like to take things too seriously. He, he just liked to play and have fun. And, you know, he was probably about... I would say probably just, just different than me, a lot more relaxed, bizarrely, and he was a really happy-go-lucky child. But the boy's mother, Josephine, had mental health problems and found it difficult to relate to her children. She just used to 
think of them as toys. And once you got them, like some children get a doll and they look they like it for the first week or something and then they throw it in the toy box. That's what she did with the, the two boys. Josephine had trained as a professional draftswoman but had been having a hard time at work and drifted in and out of her son's lives. She just was a very, very difficult person. She, you asked her a question, she wasn't there. She was in a different world. She came home for a few days over the Christmas to be with, with the family and she was sitting in the corner and talking to herself, really quite worrying to me. Another strain was their mother's unwillingness to tell either boy anything about their absent fathers. We didn't really talk about that too much. It, it wasn't something, I mean, it was something that was probably messing me up a bit in the head as well. But we, we both kind of, I don't know, suffered in silence with respect to that. My mum really hated my dad, you know, and uh, to the point where she wouldn't ever see him. But I mean, I used to get passed from pillar to post and you just get on with it, but it's not a home. It's not, you know, and you might seem like you're happy, but you're not. With his mother having difficulties, Raoul was effectively raised by his grandmother. He seems to have had a strong and loving relationship with her. Not knowing who his father was um, definitely plays a role in him feeling very alone and very isolated. But we have to remember that his grandmother took over a role of being maternal and it sounds like she did a, a pretty good job actually. In 1986, Josephine married and Raoul and Angus moved into their parental home. It seemed like a more stable family environment, but the teenagers didn't always get along with their new stepfather. Raoul was uh, younger than me and a little smaller at the time. And I did see an occasion where he, he got into trouble and uh, Brian picked him up and bashed him into the wall, which basically broke the, paper, the, the plaster work. Their stepfather says he never violently abused Raoul. In 1988, Angus went to university. Raoul, left on his own, drifted away from home. He takes a decision himself to cut himself off from the family. You, you can't always look back to childhood that, to have all the answers. There is a point in someone's adult life where they have to take responsibility and I don't see him taking any responsibility at any point. Moat's escape from home was to become a strong man. Martial arts lessons and a regimented weight training routine transformed him from a weak, asthmatic child into one of the biggest men in Newcastle. Men often like Moat hate to be thought of as, as stupid or thick or a dupe or, or, or weak. You know, it's very important to be strong. It becomes your defence against the world. One thing you don't want exposed is that core or vulnerability, or softness. He was strong, he was unbelievably strong. I mean, I trained with him. He's like, certain people can be big, but not very strong, but he was both. Raoul's friend, Tony Wright, introduced him to an exciting new world. He became a bouncer, manning the doors of Newcastle's pubs and clubs. He enjoyed that stature, and some said it was because he felt as a child, he had no control and he was bullied and he was weedy and asthmatic. So what he chooses to do later on in life is pump himself up to become the absolute opposite. And I mean, Raoul always a smiley face, a jokey character, you know, a, you know, a pinch of a lass's bum when she walked past or a cheeky shout up the street, you know. His position would be one of a, an, attractive, uh, an attractive element to girls trying to get into a club. And I think he probably had the potential to be quite charismatic. Being a bouncer gave Moat importance, not just with the girls. He could now exert control and authority over the punters too. He'd ask people to leave and he'd give them a, like, a couple of chances to walk out if they weren't fighting, if it was just arguing. And if they wouldn't walk out, he would just pick them up and just literally carry them out. I'm not a bad bloke, I'm not a bad bloke. I know I've got myself in there. Over the past, when I've been on the doors, you know, I have got myself in the scrapes. But, I mean, I've always been... I'm not the first one to throw a punch. I'm never... I'm, I've got to protect myself, you know. But if the punter's aggression was directed at him, Moat took a more confrontational approach. We all did have quite a, um, an adversarial personality. To him, maybe compromising was seen as backing down and, you know, maybe he didn't approach things quite as subtly as he ought to have done. Away from the clubs, 
different rules applied. Disputes were settled with fights the locals called straighteners. Normally it would be either a pre-arranged place where they would both turn up um, and you would both, you would both get it on, you know. And you'd, I mean, it, in the olden days they reckon you used to shake hands afterwards after you had a fight and you'd walk off. <laughs> you didn't shake hands after they had these sort of fights. They were actually opportunities to show that he was a strong person who could get things straight. I mean, that word straighteners comes out a lot of the time. And that it actually reinforced and bolstered his self-esteem. But some of Moat's adversaries refused to abide by the code of straighteners and resorted to dirtier tactics. A lot of people were little scrotes. They would do something to him, sneaky, like smash his windows or damage his car, and then they would go into hiding and he couldn't find them. But his, his own sort of personal justice was he would uh, he would set fire to their cars. He'd say, like, oh, I managed to get that so-and-so back for what he did. But, uh, I don't know, it's just, that was just Raoul. You know, I mean, I've been shot at three times over the period of time when I was on the doors. And to be honest with you, you never know where it's come from. He did have a reputation that if you, if you wanted to start something with him, that he would finish it. These feuds drove Moat to his first use of technology to monitor his enemies. He set up cameras all over his home and garden. These extreme measures were an early sign of his paranoid sensitivity. He had his house cameraed, he had cameras on his cars, he had cameras outside the front door of his flat watching who came up the stairs, hidden cameras. That's where he got his obsession for cameras from. I was looking at his possessions in the loft and there were boxes and boxes and boxes of VHS videotapes with the date written on them and obviously from the CCTV footage. And I did think, you know, this he's, he's, he's losing the plot here a bit, you know, he's, he's recording stuff all the time. Taping people without their knowledge is a very clear sign of uh, paranoid functioning, really, that he demonstrates. Moat had developed a particular paranoia about the police. His career as a bouncer had brought him into contact with them. And he liked to tell a story about a single incident in the distant past, which he claimed had led the police to victimise him ever since. I was only a kid, I was only some like, oh God, I would have been 22, 23. I caught a, a bunch of coppers sniffing coke. Mind I had a bit of, like, about nearly three quarter ounce between them on a sink in the club. So of course I went in and grabbed the kids and they all pulled the badges out. So of course I've had a bit wrestle with him, you know what I mean? And because uh, I put two in the horse and hide the other one, the main one, and the, um, and the staff who went took his gear off him. Chief Inspector come down, lost his big job, started losing his contracts for the doors, and just fucked me life up ever since. But there may have been a rather different connection between Moat and drugs. The father of a future girlfriend checked up on Moat after he'd first met his daughter. I'm on the phone call I made was to a friend of mine and uh, to find out what role actually did for a living and, and what he was like as a person and basically I was just told that he was a drug dealer as in cocaine and other things. The turbulence and need for control Moat displayed as a strong man and bouncer was matched in his private life. His girlfriends had to behave exactly as he wanted. It was always going to be tough uh, to go out with Raoul. I mean, a lot, a lot of times I would say, you know, it, I pity some of the some of the lasses that he goes with because he used to just want to stay in the house and he wanted his partners to stay in the house as well. He seemed to lay down all these rules and conditions, not wanting them to get above a size 10 and being quite clear about what he expected them to eat, who they should see, the fact he didn't want them having other male friends. And he's saying that he wasn't getting affection at home you know, off his girlfriends or that there's a chance they were going to leave him, you know, that he just he blew up. Moat's nine-year on-off relationship with Marissa Ree, mother of two of his children, was marked by aggression. They both used to get in massive, massive fights, but these other relationships were all identical, you know. Um, they could be extremely violent sometimes. When Marissa did try to move on, Moat used moral blackmail to get her back. A lot of taking her overdose, um, and, and, and from what I can gather, he, he basically been taken to hospital. They had to cut his leather jacket off him 
and put them in my stomach. You take in, uh, an overdose of something called GHB, which I believe is um, something they use in the bodybuilding circles to, uh, to to increase your performance really when you're training and things. But he'd taken a load of that stuff. I think they were, they were having a rocky relationship at the time and he, he was keen to get her back and you know maybe this overdose was a part of your cry for help. Threatening suicide when someone does something that you don't want them to do or someone's trying to leave the relationship so you have a superficial attempt at your own life. That was his way of manipulating the situation and controlling that person. These attempted suicides were a key reason why Moat had a history of being treated by psychiatrists. At a meeting with social workers, he gave an account of how they'd assessed him. They were concerned at first that you were probably, you know, delusional and all that kind of thing, and they said they did a lot of digging, and you were, the facts are, you were persecuted by North Korea police, and it was really affecting your frame of mind. It was making you very stressed, very depressed, you know, and, and you were struggling to cope. And uh, they were saying on that note, you know, that they, they they, there was no psychotic episode, you know, any evidence of anything like that. Cleo Van Velsen says Moat's account of a psychiatrist going along with his theory of police persecution is improbable, but the story may contain a general truth. It might be that they felt that there was no obvious mental illness, which is probably true, and that there wasn't very much they could do to help him. Raoul Moat may not have been clinically insane, but he was capable of rage, violence and jealousy. That explosive combination would eventually lead to tragedy. In 2005, Raoul Mote met the woman he believed was the love of his life, Samantha Stobart. She was only 16, very impressionable. You know what I mean? He is a bouncer. It's like a little bit of a status symbol, in it? I said, you don't look past his shoulders. She says, what do you mean? I says, well, you've looked at his six-pack and you've looked at his muscles, but you haven't looked at his face. <laughs> Moat split up with Marissa and gained custody of their two children. Sam moved in with them. Then in 2007, Sam and Moat had a child of their own. He gave up his career as a bouncer and said he wanted to settle down to family life. But Moat's jealousy soon flared up. Many times Sam has told me that if they were out, when they used to go clubbing, if anybody looked at her, he would go for them. And I thought, he just wants a trophy on his arm. He controlled her, definitely. And he controlled her through fear more than anything else. It's the fear of what might happen. Moat would later claim to social workers that Sam gave as good as she got. I don't have a relationship with Sam that you think that I do, you think I have, right? I mean, you'd think a good punch to the back would sort it out, wouldn't you? You know, Sam's very difficult for me to deal with, you know? I mean, I can't pull any strings with Sam, right? Sam's our own person. The fact of the matter is, I don't have that kind of relationship where I overpower her. To Sam, the picture was rather different. She basically should just come to accept if she had done something slightly wrong, a slap or a punch was normal. She really did. But it's, uh, it's not normal, is it? Once I did see her, uh, yeah, I'm not here to lie, I did see her with a cut on her head and she did tell me that Raul had uh, pushed down, she banged her head off the floor. He, he admitted that's what happened and he felt terrible over it, you know. He admitted to pushing, shoving and slapping Sam and it's actually an attempt at minimisation. It's like, I wasn't really violent. I think that he was in a conflict because he felt very strongly that violence against women wasn't right. And yet he was. Whenever Moat's aggression got too much, Sam took refuge with her grandmother. In January 2009, she turned up with all her bags and their daughter. The last straw was he'd throw a stool at Samantha in an argument. It had Miss Samantha and it had black my granddaughter's eye. And I know the little girl's face was marked, but at that time I didn't know why. And I, I never, I made it a rule never to question her. I just let her take her time and tell me what she wanted me to know. Moat could not accept that his own actions had driven Sam away. He became convinced that she was seeing someone else. In a foretaste of what was to come, he went to the grandmother's house. Raoul had 
was on his way over to mine with a gun. He was going to do some damage. And he rang me and he told me he had a gun and I rang Sam and told her he was outside. I said, there's nobody with us. I says, for a start, I wouldn't allow anybody to bring lads to the house, not to my house. I says, I'm not running a brothel. <laughs> Eventually, Sam convinced Moat to leave. Despite this potentially fatal episode, Sam, as she had before, returned to him. He seemed to have some kind of hold over a number of women that he saw. They felt spellbound by, by Moat, that they were in love, or was there some kind of dependency? I don't know. Only they really know what went on in those relationships. She really did idolise him. But there again, she was still young. She, she'd never really had... I don't think she'd had many boyfriends to sort of compare him with. By July 2009, Sam was back living with Moat, but his two elder children had been taken into care. Then on July the 20th, his life took a further devastating turn. At a McDonald's restaurant in Newcastle, a social worker said he'd committed a verbal assault. Moat was arrested and charged. He was now on both this and the original charge of assaulting a child. He saw it as all part of the mounting conspiracy against him. The police hate me, they cannot stand me. If I got shot in the middle of the night, right, then I would get arrested for it and well, should be be charged. Yeah. But Moat's rage was not only directed at the police. He now also had social services in his sights. In particular, a social worker who'd reported him for the verbal abuse. I've seen I've kicked off in McDonald's, you know what I mean? I want to know why she's seen it, because she's just bare-faced light. Moat claimed he taped the meeting at McDonald's and that the recording would clear him. But significantly, this tape was not among the 26 hours he selected to give a friend. The tapes didn't show what he was trying to prove, which was that he was being fitted up. Um, that, to me, tells a very powerful story. You know, each time he's trying to entrap somebody, he's trying to take them to a certain place. And unfortunately, the evidence didn't show that. After the incident at McDonald's, it seems that his paranoid attitudes towards social services seem to spiral. They become much more like his feelings around the police. I think that there might have been an element of actually almost having a delusional belief about the conspiracy. And at those moments, it's almost as if he crosses the border into almost a paranoid psychosis. But one has to be careful about saying that, because on the whole, I don't think there's evidence that he was mentally ill. I mean, this case has gone on for four and a half months. Nothing, absolutely nothing to get a fair investigation done. It's everything to get Mr Moat and nothing to build up a proper picture, which to me is an indication that there's just massive corruption behind. He is someone who never accepts responsibility for anything, so he blames... It's so much easier to blame everybody else. It was the police's fault, it was the social services' fault, it's his childhood. Nothing is ever close to, actually, I did something not great here and I'm going to take responsibility for it. Moat put most of his energy into blaming others. But at a meeting with social workers, he also lapsed into bouts of self-pity. I actually feel like I've, I've been tried convicted and go to jail right now, in the sense that, you know, I'm in the house on my own, you know, I can't be around my loved ones. I know I'm not in jail, but it feels like I'm already in jail and I have been for some time. He had a very selfish view of the world. Everything revolved around him. Um, and that's really one of the key problems in the world was a very small world for him, a goldfish bowl. Um, and it was one where lots of problems started to bottle and he was, in essence, a smouldering volcano. There were occasional moments of self-awareness. At one meeting in October, Moat fleetingly displayed an understanding that he could come across as intimidating. But he pointed to a range of explanations for this. One was his sheer physical bulk. I've got this size. It's a, it's a massive drawback that I can't express myself and I have done my best to come in and not blow my stack in there's times when it's difficult, you know. But Moat was now evolving a further conspiracy theory that the authorities were deliberately trying to goad him to blow his stack. You know, people have been trying to bait us into doing it. You know? 
Ну. A tu chwilę się będzie zdecyduje. A tu chwilę i lat dołem. Ale to jest all I'm seeing. There's a huge difference between me intimidating someone and someone feeling intimidated. I don't get the sense that this man was a cold-blooded person with psychopathic traits who just blatantly lied consciously. That it was much more, in a way, disturbing than that for him. That he just couldn't see it. That he, he at times you always feel that his anger is about frustration and bewilderment. He can't understand why people keep telling him that he's so intimidating or frightening or, or that he's been violent, because he doesn't get it. Because it would go so against his very strong view of who he is, namely a good man, a good father and a good partner. Moat's image of himself dictated his dreams. If only everyone would leave him alone, he could lead a peaceful life with his family, working as a tree surgeon. I promised the kids a farm long ago, get a farm with a lake with a fishing, you know, where we could go fishing on the lake, like what I had when I lived with me when I was a kid, right? He wanted uh, to love them and he wanted to try and do the right thing, it's just he didn't know how to, and that's not excusing his behaviour. I genuinely think he wasn't equipped with the tools to have healthy relationships and he never took responsibility to try and understand or learn. But Moat was unable to escape his character or the violence of his world. And now in a strange twist in his unfolding story, that world came back to haunt him. On October the 12th, 2009, Moat saw the police again. There was a nasty surprise in store. We've received some information that there may be persons or persons who may want to cause you some harm. Right. To do with this I case and my kids. No, totally nothing to do with that. I've got no rich with anybody I've been up the doors for nearly right. five years. The only disputes I've got with anybody nowadays is the ongoing moment. Moat had one long running feud, but he cast around for other possible threats. One of the guys who did get a hold of it was somebody to do with his wife. I'd been speaking with his wife. He kept turning up and announcing he was going to do this, something, and but he uh, ended up tossing that dog off the line. He didn't, he instead. So he's in jail. After weighing up all the options, the view of the world Moat had now developed led him to one conclusion. The police were deliberately stoking up his one continuing feud to provoke him. Up in the house, yeah, right. You, you, you know, you create a possibility you're flaring something up, but the only enemy that I really have got locally. Now, with regards to the kind of things that he does, I mean, I've had slash tires on the truck recently. You know, I've had a broken window, but, but what I'm saying to you, it's putting me and him at loggerheads again. And if it's not him, you need to tell us. I think what's been happening here is you have got specific information, and I think it's a deliberate attempt to get me wound up. You know, under the present circumstances, well, that's how I've taken it. We have not given you that information with the intention of getting you wound up deliberately. That's not a tactic that nothing really police would use. I just think the timing's just too perfect just for me to jump out my house and my boxers and get a hold of that skinny little Kermit chin and knock him would just be fantastic for Northern Rear Police right now. I'm completely at a loss as to why you causing harm to would be of benefit to Northern Rear Police. The dependent case at the minute, you know, you're trying to prove that I'm out of control, that I'm violent. It's, um, it's part of that hunting season on Mr Moore again, I think, by Northern Rear Police. Well, I can assure you there's no hunting season on Mr Moore. By November 2009, police had decided not to prosecute the verbal assault charge against Moat. But the physical assault charge remained. Moat suspected he'd be found guilty. So he instructed his solicitor to try to make a deal with Northumbria police. He would offer to confess to any unsolved crime on their books and go to prison for years if necessary, as long as he was let off the assault charge. I'm in the opinion now where I said, let's just make it deal. Just make a deal. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna admit to this because this is something I haven't done and this is something that'll affect the kids forever. It's one of them things where they would just say, look, that's it. You know, you can't live with your kids. Christmas 2009 passed, but it would not be a family celebration. In the coming months, Moat's rage would drive him to kill. January the 20th this year, Ral Moat 
went to another meeting with social workers. The time is 11 o'clock. And it's another session of, uh, no doubt, Raoul is a bad man, and we are wonderful. His unfounded accusations poured out, and his deceit. Right, and I'm not putting up with this kind of rubbish, right? This, I'm recording everything. I record everything, because I'm, I'm sick and tired of the lies, right? No, I'm not recording this conversation. Well, I find it worrying the way that you refuse to expect any responsibility from members of staff and the other event. Moat was also now blaming social services for a worsening in his relationship with Sam. His two elder children were still in care, and Sam knew that if her own daughter continued to live with Moat, she might also be taken into care. You know, I mean, this is what you've done. You've basically, you've chased me partner away. You've made well live separately. It's very clear what you're saying. It's just terrified of you. And that's the problem. That's not something I've done. Well, that's something you've done. She's more afraid of you than what you ever will be of me, well, you know? Sam was indeed scared that Moat's presence might lead to her child being removed. But she was far more frightened of Moat himself. I don't know. She, she just she couldn't get the message to him that she didn't want nothing more to do with him. And, well, really, she couldn't because she was scared. She, she, she couldn't tell. She was literally petrified. Moat, through his own conduct and character, was isolated, his dreams falling apart. This has crippled this family, you know. It's absolutely crippled this. And I'm trying my best, and my best is never good enough, no matter what. Because I can't please you, I can't please Sam, I can't please the kids, and I can't please, I don't please myself. The period of Moat's recordings was coming to a close, and he too was reaching the end of the line. That was a bad man from every angle, and I'm getting crucified. My family's being, everything I've worked hard for, I've lived in England on my own, I've been a loner away from all my family, and my whole life was based on building my family with these girls. These girls are everything to me, everything. I'm a hunter, I can't I'm a protector, you know? I'd rather do a 10 stretch than have your kids taken off me, right? It's the worst thing that could possibly happen. It might be known to a lot of people, it's a big deal to me, because then what have I got? I've got nothing. In April this year, Moat was found guilty of the common assault on a child. He refused to cooperate with the probation service, so instead of a community service order, he went to prison, determined to appeal the verdict. With him locked up, Sam knew she finally had to tear herself away from him. She actually got the courage to sit face to face and say, look, it's over, it's been over for a long time. But apparently even in the visit room, he jumped up and he was shouting and bawling at her. She spoke to him two days before he got out and said that uh, she'd met somebody, she'd fell in love with him instantly, and uh, basically there was no chance of them getting back. I know Raoul and he would have sat in that cell for 23 hours a day, thinking of Sam with this lad, uh, and that would have just sent him over the edge. With Sam falling in love with another man, Moat hit rock bottom. Everyone that mattered to him was beyond his reach. If he couldn't win, neither would they. As always, the only world he could see was his world. He's got no partner. He hasn't got his children. He's been imprisoned for assault on a child. That sense of catastrophic loss with a personality like his meant that literally all hell broke loose. When people feel too contradicted, when their wishes are too thwarted, they can become enraged. And we call it a narcissistic rage, which destabilized his equilibrium to a quite a dramatic extent. On July the 1st, Moat was released from Durham Prison. He shared his feelings with the world on his Facebook page. Moat now erupted into the violence that would dominate the news for the next week. In the early hours of Saturday, July the 3rd, he headed for the house in Gateshead, where Sam and her new boyfriend, Chris Brown, were spending the evening. Yeah, Chris turned on, gave Samantha a kiss, and then turned out to walk to go at the house. And then that's when he jumped up with a gun, like an ambush. Yeah, um, and Samantha said, that's Raoul. Chris dropped his bag, started to walk towards him, and then bang, shot him in the leg. Raoul, he just levelled the gun. Chris I said, Chris was lying on the floor at this stage, obviously, face down. It was basically an execution. That's exactly what it was. I don't think Raoul Moat snapped. I think this was an accumulation 
of lots of things that had gone on. The decision to do what he did was a conscious choice. I think that was about him taking control. It's as if that state of extreme jealousy is one where you're being totally persecuted by your partner. And you have to, in psychological self-defence, kill them to feel better. And we know that a lot of violence is precipitated by jealousy. Moat had killed Chris Brown and critically injured Sam. The next day, he blinded police officer David Rathband and then he went to ground. The final step was by now inevitable. He said, I'm at a pay phone. Uh, he says, I've got to go. Uh, I've got two cartridges left and I'm going to shoot myself. And I, I said, don't talk stupid. And then he said, uh, I love you. And then that was it, he put the phone down. So that was, the, that was the last I heard of him. He, 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 didn't, he never rang us back. When you've got someone who's suicidal, it's a very thin line to them becoming homicidal. The two are inextricably linked, and I think as well as uh, him knowing he was going to take his own life, he wanted to take other people down with him too in you know, a wipeout, a revenge kill type situation. It wasn't random, it was planned, and he wanted to mete out that punishment on them before he decided to kill himself. Next week's Cutting Edge is a remarkable journey through rehab. What's life like after a brain injury? My new brain, next Wednesday at nine. Next tonight, it's a right washout in Big Brother.